We are here to talk about ensemble models. The learning objectives are to learn how to create a data stack for the stacks package using stacks and add candidates, fit a meta learning model using blend predictions, fit the member models using fit members and test the results of an ensemble model. And if this doesn't make sense, we're gonna go through each step, so no worries. All right, so taking a step back, like what is ensembling? So a model ensemble is a combination of multiple single learners, which that combination makes for a stronger model. And this underlies some of the models we've already seen like bagging, random forests and boosting. And any type of model can be ensembled. And when we talk about model stacking, it involves the combination of candidate models that can be of any type to create a new model. And that new model has oftentimes superior predictive performance. And so the stacking model can contain different types of models, right? So any type of model, but it can also contain different configurations of the same model. And we'll see that in action with the example that we're going to use. Hey, Pavitra. So, awesome. how are you? Hey, I'm, do I'm doing well. How are you? Doing good. Thank you. I'm actually at my uh, sixth graders music performance. So if you hear like the oboe or a bassoon in the background, please excuse me. Oh my God, I love that. Some background music. Wait. All right, so for ensembling, we're going to use one of the tiny models packages, the stacks package uh, developed by our very own celebrity here today, Simon Couch. Um, model stacking involves fitting a regularized linear model to the predictions of the candidate models, and only candidate models with a non-zero stacking coefficient are retained. And after that, I uh, copied Simon's notes of the different steps involved in making a model stack. So um, if this doesn't quite make sense, we're going to go through each step in sequence. But this is just to get like a bird's eye view of the steps involved. And his graphic here is super, super useful. I had to like go back and look at it a few times to, to understand what's going on. So we'll keep, we'll keep going back to it as needed as we go through the different implementation steps. Okay, so first things first, as we've seen, I think throughout this book is we need to set up a training set for our new model, our meta learning model. So to illustrate this, we're going to go back to chapter 15, in which we fit a model predicting the comp compressive strength of concrete. Sorry, it's not the most exciting subject, but the code was already set up and it was easy to follow. So I'm using that. Uh, so we're not going to like go down, go down every line of code here, um, but you know, I think it's the same steps we've seen throughout this book. So first we get our data, we split it. Uh, we did here a tenfold cross validation. We set up our recipes. In this case, we have two recipes, uh, one that's normalized and one with polynomial and interaction terms. Then we specify the different models that we want to use, and there's 12 in total. Then we put everything in workflow sets because we want to try different tuning parameters and configurations. And then this code is commented out, that's our tuning, because it takes a buttload of time and I didn't want to do it again as I'm knitting. So I wrote the results, which are called race results. I read them back in. And then this is the very last step in our modeling workflow, which is 
first extracting the best performing model and then fitting it on our test set and then collecting our performance metrics, which are RMSC and R squared. And we'll be focusing on RMSC. So this number is going to be important at the end to evaluate whether ensembling helps us make a better predictive model than the original one we used. Right, so that's, that's the model that we've decided to work with. But going back to ensembling, so the first step in ensembling is creating this training set for it. And this training set for it is composed of the holdout predictions from each candidate model's training set. So I had to like sit with that for a while. Um, holdout predictions, i.e. assessment set predictions. So if we go back to this example, we just ran through, we had five assessment set predictions for each training set sample. And this is a preview of just all the ones we've been working with. And you'll see that bagged tree only has one column here because it didn't have any tuning parameters. Mars had one and we tested it out on two values. Cubist has like 25 and so on and so on. This is not a complete list of of every configuration. But to get our training set going with stacks is first we load the stacks package, obviously, and then we initialize things by making a call to stacks. And I watched Simon Couch's presentation about why we need to call this stacks um, command before getting things started. And you can think of it as like ggplot. It just helps us initialize uh, things. And then right after that, we can pass it add candidates where we can add the assessment set predictions. So in this case, we're passing it our whole workflow set object, which we've previously called race results. And we can print this data stack, which we've called concrete stack, to get what our stack is composed of. So 12 model definitions, because we've worked with 12 models so far, and we can see that it retained just 18 candidate members. And why is that? Well, if we go back to our code, we used ANOVA racing, which is a more efficient way of performing grid search, where it won't really evaluate all configurations on all resamples. So why does it only have 18 candidate members? Well, it's because by definition, Stacks only uses model configurations that have a complete set of resamples. And in this case- So I think this, another question. Yeah, go ahead. So I, I love the ANOVA racing too, because it definitely speeds things up. Do you think that there are certain tuning methods that work better for stacks versus others? Where like maybe, like we all know that a, a full grid search can be pretty inefficient, but if your plan is to take it to stacks later, is it better to have like a lot of models, some of which might not be bad, but capture something different? That's a good question. I think Max puts in his notes that ANOVA racing works best with stacks because we get rid of a lot of model configurations that don't have the best tuning parameter values. But that would be something I'd be interested. You know, if I'm fitting a model, I may as well, since it's so easy to set up, I may as well just pass it like uh, other tuning methods and see and see what shakes out. Simon, what do you think? <laughs> do you have any thoughts? <laughs> I think like kind of the the rule of thumb that I've heard from Max and other people that like spend a lot of time thinking about ensembling is like introducing as diverse an array of hyperparameters as you can 
um, or or even like assumptions about uh, a data generating process um, in the first place. Like sometimes parameterizations that seem kind of goofy um, capture some dimension of the data generating process that um, isn't being picked up on by uh, other models in the in the stack. So that's that's not a direct answer at all, um, but maybe a good search in this case is that. Uh, yeah, with statisticians, it's always like it depends, and it's a really frustrating answer in some cases. But I think he's he's absolutely right, and the beauty of stacks is that's the next bullet point here is it can really accept objects of all kinds so you know if if it's not if it's not too difficult i would definitely try um with um as many configurations as as you want i would i mean i i think part of the idea there is if you have time to put more things into your ensemble it's not going to hurt um but there you know there's a cost so that's always the balance that the racing is going to find the good ones faster. So it's going to find more, you know, it's going to get through more options basically, but it will skip some of those like crazy ones that you might actually want in your stack. So if you can afford the time, probably wouldn't hurt. So, but yes, I think it is definitely one of those. Eh, yeah. Or maybe no. <laughs> one of the nice things, uh, or I don't know about nice, it can be very counterintuitive as well about building a stack is that you don't get that like monotone increase in in whatever your performance metric is as you increase the size of um, predictor subset or in this case like number of models. So sometimes if you add a truly crazy model, you might see your uh, predictive performance decrease. Does that have more to do with ensemble models or like a lasso technique, right? Because like a lasso should not improve if it's not like it'll just filter that out, right? Or is it something I don't know about ensembling models? So I think that that possibility of a decrease is partially um, owed to to resampling, um, and so like the the kind of interface of stacks makes it really fussy um, to, to to supply sorts of objects that um, aren't that are reusing uh, subsets of the, the training data. Um, but I, that's honestly something that I still have trouble wrapping my head around, like how it could be that yeah. performance is decreasing. Cool. Thanks. Sorry for sidetracking you. Oh, no, don't be sorry. All right. Okay. So the next step is, quote unquote, blending the predictions. Um, so really what we're creating here is a meta learning model which is composed of the training set predictions and the corresponding observed outcome data. That's really our, our data stack that we did in the, in the, previous, in the previous step. Um, and in this meta-learning model, the assessment set predictions are the predictors of the observed outcome data. So that's, that's something that I had to sit with for a little bit and refer to Simon, Simon's um, infographic there. So to fit this meta-learning model, Stax uses a regularized, generalized linear model with lasso penalty. And I'm gonna touch on a few points regarding that. So the literature says that when a linear model is used to blend these predictions, only models with non-zero stacking coefficients, so i.e. the betas of the model should be retained. And that's because 
if they have a non-zero stacking coefficient, that means they're influential in the predictions. Hope I said that correctly. The advantages of a lasso penalty is that it can remove candidates like the ones with too high of a correlation between each other, which is frequently the, the case. Um, so with that last bullet point that I just touched upon, um, does it, does it make sense to have as many like model configurations as one can think of in terms of model stacking? Because the lasso penalty will just take care of the ones that have too high of a correlation between each other? Or should we still try to be parsimonious in this case? I think not, um, but it's an interesting question, I think. Uh so I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Tony. This is, this is more about like, I guess, blue net in general, but like, why is the defaults like lasso and not elastic net? Just a mix of lasso and ridge. Um, I don't know, I guess that's, it's not all that important, I guess, but I, I, I'm wondering if anyone knows or has some thoughts on that. It's, it's cool if <laughs> I jump in. Uh, the, so the first version of the first initial release of Stacks, I think it was 010. Um, the lasso was the only um, kind of configuration of um, a Glimnet model that was like officially supported in the sense that like there were there were arguments to Stacks functions that um, made that happen, and in I can't remember if it was the, the second or the third release. Um, we introduced um, a, a second parameter to, parameter to officially support the elastic net. Um, and I honestly can't remember. I do think the elastic net is now the default, um, which I'm okay. hearing that I need to update that, those docs and I missed this somewhere. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think maybe the book also needs to be updated. Yeah, I was going to say, I think one of the great things about this uh, this club is we uh, find these issues. So <laughs> we're this, ahead of the book. Uh, this is book club driven development. <laughs> I think it is. <laughs> yeah. God, that is good. <laughs> Max, if you're listening. Yeah. Uh, Throw in the fun? notes if not, because he reads those. Um. All right. <laughs> Uh, so your, your question about correlated predictors, right? That was what you what started this. Yeah, candidate member models. So I, I was thinking about, you know, at the end of the the tidy models book where it has that pre-processing chart, like re the recommendations, like in the appendix. If like the linear regression model, the recommendation is to decorrelate before, and so. I, I don't know the answer to your question, but I, because because earlier we were just talking about how we, we do want as many models as you as you want, but I think it's interesting that if you're just making like a, you want them to be decorrelated, right? Yeah. Just yeah, exactly. Um, the bullet points got me thinking that, I mean, you kind of want to think of the models coming in their features and so like things you would think about for feature engineering you should be thinking about at this stage as like model engineering of i already know that this model isn't giving me any useful info so why waste the time of the modeling process you know like if there's a, mo a feature you would ex exclude because you know it's noise you would exclude that so why not exclude that model if you just know it's noise um, I don't know. This isn't a fully formed thought. It's something that I'm just thinking, kind of looking at it here. But you know, it's like you could have a recipes step equivalent for all, for your models to get them ready for stacks. Um, 
You want to do a PCA? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think this is a weird kind of um, setting to think about this problem in too, because like ideally all of these predictors are perfectly correlated because the thing that we're modeling is easy to model regardless of the assertions we make about the data generating process. And so like the way that I think about um, these different predictors, different models, um, having different predictions <sighs> is that like in the blending process, the, the, the meta learner will be um, we'll be making assertions about like which of these models are actually saying useful things about the underlying structure of the data. Um, and so we could wait until uh, we just like toss the whole kitchen sink in and see um, what assertions hold true. Like that kitchen sink, kitchen sink approach. That's definitely what we did with um, when we added candidates. I think we added a total of like 25,000 models in that race results grid. Right. So blending predictions implementation wise, uh, we're going to use this, this command here, aptly named blend predictions on the data stack object, which we've called concrete stack. And then we're going to evaluate if the default lasso penalization is sufficient uh, by either uh, inspecting the object we make with blend predictions or using auto plot. So in this case, I'm, I'm using um, auto plot to take a look. And this, this was confusing. <laughs> going to need groupthink on this. Um, so basically, you know, the RMSC, that's, that's the metric uh, we care about in this case, is pretty constant as the candidate member count goes up, but then goes, goes up um, by not as huge significant margin, but it goes up as the number of candidate members goes up. So that's with the default values. And Max and Julia know that you don't have to stick with the default uh, lasso penalty value. You can actually pass an argument called penalty to test out a larger range. Of, of these values. And similarly, you can inspect how your predictive performance RMSC looks like with that new range of penalty values. And I guess my first question here is taking a look at the default values, how does one decide that they need to evaluate a larger range of these penalty values? Is it because the RMSC goes up by, it doesn't look to me like a significant right. margin. I was gonna say, I, I, I'm interested. Um, I don't have an answer, just wanted to point out that make sure you're looking at the axes on this because you know, like the RSQ, the, the R squared plot, um, has no y range <laughs> like in oh. the sync phase that we can see so it's oh, just shit. plotting to show a change but it is you know in the fifth decimal place where the change is happening so you're yeah. not it, that those are really flat lines that they choose axes to make a curve out of um so i don't know like watch that <laughs> right yeah, that's a good point. Is it that flat on the bottom chart too? Because it does look like there's more movement. Oh yeah, a little less flat. A little bit. Yeah. I, I guess to fourth of a decimal place. Four, yeah. <laughs> one twenty to four one thirty five and three eighty six to three eighty seven. Yeah. So, like to, to your original question, I guess if 
this was my these are my results and I wanted to know if I should do a wider range of penalties, I would look at for this right number, which is still improving. And and that would be my signal to fit a wider range. Like even on the bottom there, I'm like, maybe we should fit a wider rate of range of penalties than you already did because it looked like it was still getting better, even though, you know, it's hard to tell exactly how much it's getting better, but that, mm-hmm. that, that's what I look for at least. Okay. Uh, I mean, yeah, I'm a little, I'm still a little confused because like, wait, no, yeah. Okay. I get it now. Yeah. You're, you're on, the, on the edge to the right, right? Like that's like your best. So you should start exploring more yeah. higher range around that. Okay. I mean, I'm guessing that penalty coefficient will take anything from zero to one. Yeah. Or maybe he just did this for illustrative purposes, saying you can, if you want, <laughs> test out more penalty values. Um, but yeah, it wasn't immediately clear to me. I guess we just have to settle on if the lines aren't flat, just for completeness sake, try out more values. So yeah, so from inspecting inspecting these, these two graphs, I think we can see that the best penalty value is going to be 0.01. And we can also print out the object we made with blend predictions to um, get uh, specifications over the best penalty value and how many it ended up retaining, which in this case is eight. We can also see the most influential uh, model configurations, which is boosting. And that was the, the case also with our original model. Okay, and you can use auto plot again to, to visually see this. Okay, so that concludes our blending step. The next step is to, to fit the member models. So basically now we're gonna fit on the entire training set with the original predictors. And the implementation here is uh, with just one, one command, fit members on the object we've previously made with blend predictions, which is for for ensemble. And the last step is to predict on new data. You know, a familiar step here. So on the test set with predict. And once we gather our performance metrics, we can see that the RMSC is slightly better than our original model. So with ensembling, it's 339, and previously it was 349. So the stacked ensemble performs better, um, although marginally, but we'll take it. So that concludes our walkthrough of stacks. Um, I think it's I think it's really, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not just pandering to Simon here. I think it's it's really cleverly designed, super easy to use, and it makes it, you know, just a non-brainer when it comes to building predictive models, you know, with just essentially three, three commands, you know, stacks, add candidates, blend predictions, fit members, um, and predict, you know, you can see if, if you get any sort of predictive advantage with, with ensembling. So that's that, guys. If you have any questions, ask Simon. <laughs> <It's> not me. <laughs> okay, I got a question. Got a question. <laughs> very important here. Uh, so in Slice, uh, there was a very common workflow was to, because we had like a true holdout set, right? With no like uh, actual values that we could like 
you know, evaluate on because that was the whole point of the composition. Uh, so the common strategy was to like take your label data, split that into train test set, and then just hope for the best when like predicting on the holdout set and uploading to Kaggle. Um, how would you approach to like, would you split with something like this um, with, with stacks? Like, uh, I guess, is that the still like the best strategy when you have like a big ensemble, I guess, that you can have, uh, that you can use? Or like, I don't know, is it okay to use <laughs> all the data? Um, I, I think there was like some other like actual, um, I, I don't remember why I couldn't get it to work for this, the typical workflow of splitting on your label data and all that. Um, but uh, I don't know, is, that, is there anything different about, I guess, ensembling in terms of like your data science, like best practices and, and then, like a setting like that where you have like a true holdout set? Is this one actually for me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, mean, that was, uh, anyone, <laughs> I think I can answer is just, uh, I mean, I think, they, I think the answer is like, yeah, you kind of follow the same workflow. And honestly, I should have come better prepared. I can't remember why I couldn't get, I wasn't using it for the competition. Um, there was like an actual, like, I just couldn't get something to work. And um, I don't know, now I don't remember what it was. Probably, probably operator error, but. I guess now I'm just asking in general, like to how you would approach something where you have like a true holdout set um, and uh, like one label set, like you'd still split it, do your normal like train test stuff. Yeah, so I would I would say the the procedure in terms of partitioning your data, I'm not aware of any like difference in philosophy of whether that should differ between like a, a typical or a, a unimodel, I guess you could say setting in something like stacks. Um, and it's kind of obscured by the object classes in stacks. And I wish we had made this a bit more prominent in like the print methods and things like that. Um, but the sort of like partitioning into training and um, as you say, like true holdout set um, is kind of happening on the back end with the the construction of the data stacks. Um, Asma, what was the the um, like R sample? What what type of like train test split resample did you use for these slides? Okay, vfold cross validation. So, like, I think what is the def five repeats of tenfold cross validation? So, one of these sets is going to be like the true holdout, like you say, in um, the construction of the data stack takes place where like each model gets an opportunity to train on all but one of whatever those folds are. And the, the columns that end up collated in the data stack are the averages of the predictions from each of those models trained on all but one of the, um, the, the folds in the, the resamples. Um, and so that, that holdout set is what is actually reflected in the, in the data stack, where the first column of the data stack is act the, the holdout outcome values and then uh, the remaining uh, the remaining columns are the predictions from the members trained on the, the rest of the training set. I don't know if that actually gets at your question. I think, yeah, no, I think you answered that question, but now I'm reminded of, of what my issue was, was, okay, so we have the label set. And so in this case, it's concrete, right? That's in our example. Um, but I guess in the, like the sliced example, there's actually another true holdout set that we want to predict on. So say we, you know, we split like train test here, then we did do the vfold CV on the train split um, to like select the best set of like the best mix, right? Or the best penalty to use for a GlimNet model. Um, how do I like, what if I would now want to refit on everything, right? Right before I predict on the hold set, because technically I was holding out the test set so that I could get some 
uh, like estimate of like the out of sample, uh, like evaluation metrics. But like right before the end, I want to refit on all the data because now I know I have this true holdout data uh, that that's like now my new like my actual test set. Um, so here, we, yeah, we're following the same like train test and then split on the uh, do the default CD on train. But like right at the end, I want to like also retrain on the whole data set. Um, is that something I should be doing, or you know, does that even make sense at all? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. I, um, the only thing that I might note there is that like the stack that results will be different. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, something to keep in mind is you, in pretty much any case, you do have a true holdout set, which is like the future. So <laughs> like, you know, any any modeling you you have that, and so those rules of whether to keep your test set truly separate or kind of like okay, now that I know basically what I'm doing, I want to fold it in. You still are taking the risk that you you won't know if your model is actually good, <laughs> like because you have nothing that you're really testing about. You won't know. That's a, that's a good point. Until you like, use it. Does does ensembling? I guess I don't know. Maybe this is maybe I'm like trying to. Play a devil's advocate here about ensembling, but like, does ensembling make you more prone to like overfitting if like your holdout set is like more uh, just like different in some nature uh, than like your actual labeled set? Is like ensembling double down and like make your <laughs> predictions worse if if you're like overfitting or like your holdout set is different? I would I would maybe say it's as vulnerable uh, as as other methods to to doing so if you were to train with the whole training set, but I don't know. Yeah, I guess my initial thought is like, well, you probably have an error. Like you have to fix something else in your whole you know modeling process if if you I mean whether or not you know your holdout set is like fundamentally different in some way. I think. You got other problems and stacking isn't really your problem. Um, yeah, and every every technique is going to suffer from overfitting if, if the holdout set's truly different. So I have, um, I don't know, I don't know if, how weird of a case this is, but so we, we're working on something and we made a like manual bespoke model from subject matter expertise of this is what we think a bottom, like our model has to do better than this because I can write a model to predict uh, these values. And we made that model and, you know, it's not good, but it's not awful. Could you put that into an ensemble? Like, is there a way to do that? Because we made it and we're like, huh, like, I didn't think this was going to be any good and it's not... I mean, it's not good, but it's not wrong. It's not like flat wrong. <laughs> Do you this mean like writing, like writing one layer in SQL? It's uh, effectively. I mean, it's uh, it's basically a model that is a mutate step. You know, it's uh, <laughs> taking these columns and we look for a keyword there, and uh, you know that kind of thing. That we're just looking for certain things, and if this happens, then that's going to be the case. Yeah, some of the time. Like enough of the time that it's not a, you know, it's not a good model, but it's not a, it's not a bad model. It's actually equal to our first like deep learning model was just barely better than this thing we wrote by hand. And so we're like, well, we don't, we, you know, that's our baseline. We got to do better than that. And also maybe we want to include that. Is that something that you've ever thought about? <laughs> So I'm laughing because we I got this issue five days, six days ago, five days ago. Uh, and somebody was asking a really similar question. Like I have a subject matter expert poking out data points. Um, and my response was kind of tiptoey in the in the sense of like, in theory, it should work. But um, Stacks kind of expects whatever your, your inputted candidates are to kind of walk and talk like a parsing model. So right. If, um, 
if there's if you can construct like if if this model has enough form to where you can construct a, a parsnip wrapper around it and it can do things like predict on new data and fit to subsets of training data All right and sure <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I i like i was thinking about how to ask this question i was like well if i just you know basically make a model that's basically it's always the same you know the model doesn't really train on anything it's just it trained on brains and so the output of the model is the same no matter what the input data is because we we know what we think we want it to do so you could make something that like makes the model object but the model object is basically just saying hey this is a model of this type and then you make you know the thing the actual function would just be predict dot that i think that would work probably yeah. <laughs> I, I actually had something similar before and i think what i did was like a decision tree with like the number of no or like leaves is like the same as the number of observations in the data set. So <laughs> like a perfectly overfit tree and i don't know but like that might work for your case i don't know I guess, and now that I say that, maybe it would be better to just think of that as a feature of that prediction as one of the features that we put into the model. But um, yeah, it was, I don't know, it was, uh, it, we expected it to be a really crappy baseline. And like, yeah, it's not good, but it's not as bad as we thought it was going to be. So we're like, huh, ah, maybe we should like <laughs> actually use this somewhere. Um, yeah. <laughs> If you do it, I would love to see it. <laughs> All right. I, I will let you know. Awesome. I think we're finishing right on time for Tony's bedtime at 8.45. So... My bedtime, okay. <laughs> any other burning questions for predominantly Simon Couch? Let me check the, the chat. <laughs> um. I, I had to walk away for a minute, but so I apologize if if you covered this already. Can you go back to like your your second slide, your second page? It was one of the statements that you said you had to sit with for a second. Oh, just wrapping my head around what constitutes the the training set for. Oh, no. Yeah, because like in a in a tuning method you're feeding in something that's got to be cross-validated or i mean it doesn't have to be cross-validated so how is there an assessment set if it's using like there's not an assessment set per se in a in a um like a tuning object is there so the pretty slick Thing about those tuning results objects is that they do kind of let the R sample um, object that the, the hyperparameters were tuned on kind of piggyback along inside of the object. So stacks actually, and I wish, like, I wish this was somehow Funny. more explicit in the grammar that that um, stacks landed on. Like maybe you pass the resample to the stacks function or something like that. Um, but that, that cross-validation is happening. So like in this case, I think it's a, a feed cross-validation and um, the assessment set predictions are the, the, like the models are trained on uh, all but one of the, the samples, however they're defined in the resampling procedure. And then uh, the, the true outcome and the predictions from each of the candidate members are the the predictions on that remainder of the uh, that that one last fold in the three samples. Okay, yeah, that, that's awesome. I guess it, like you said, it, it's kind of hidden inside the mm -hmm. the object. So that that was kind of my burning question. Like, I'm, I just want to make sure I wasn't overfitting. A whole bunch of stuff without any without any cross validation. So that's a relief. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, and there there there's also the concern of double dipping uh, in the sense of like once 
once you uh, have trained your meta learner on that data stack and go back and do the fit member step on the, the whole data set, I think there's also the, um, like a, a, a natural kind of like eyebrow raise of like, oh, is that fair game? But mm -hmm. it's all right. <laughs> it turns out it's okay. <laughs> Hi, buddy. <laughs> got that text. I gotta tuck him into bed. <laughs> Tony and Buddy, eight forty-five. Yeah. Awesome. So, thank you guys for coming out. I really appreciate this and helping me better understand stacks. So, I guess before we all all take off. Do we want to meet next week? Do we, does someone want to try to present 21, even though it doesn't build on all platforms right now? Do we want to take a week off? Anyone have any thoughts before we take off? I So I will say I've got plenty going on that I'm okay with us just not meeting until 21 actually exists, but I'm also totally okay with us, you know, doing another book or whatever. So. I welcome thoughts. And if no one has any definite answers, we can always take it to the Slack. Um, um, right. I, would... I did want to take a look at, I think David Robinson had used stacks on one of the sliced competitions, if I recall correctly. I would want to go look at his code and maybe take a look at it together in light of what Tony was bringing up. See how he did it. <laughs> I mean, I'd be up for it. I can't lead that, but <laughs> <laughs> if yeah, someone wants yeah. to prep that, that'd be great. Yeah, um, we can play it by ear for sure. Um, if I have something together by Monday night, I'll circle back with the group. With special effects and... Uh, <laughs> and Dave Rob. Yeah, bring in D-Rob. <laughs> <D> <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be hysterical. Yeah, we'll see. All right. You were going to say uh, something, Sid? Yeah, just after... Uh, I, I mean, I would like to do 21 maybe when, when it's published too, but um, definitely I, I, you know, I'd like to do another book club. I just the, the accountability of it all has, has been good for me. Um, for sure. We don't have to pick that right now or, or, or at the time, but just I would like it. It's, it's good. Yeah, technically we also have Chapter 16, but mm. there is no draft of that one yet that they've put up. On, uh, on GitHub, so 21 and 16, that's what we're waiting for. Um, but yeah, like, okay, we'll talk about it on the Slack. Um, we could all do, go do another book. We could do, like, I, I think some of our coolest weeks now have been, hey, we've read a lot of books. Let's all just demo things now. So there are lots of options. Um, it's, it can turn into, you know, practicing for giving talks club. Um, <laughs> so, all right. I will see everybody thank on Simon Slack. Thank you for coming. Yes, thank Simon. you so much. Thanks, Thank you. Yeah. And, yeah. and yes. Thanks, John, for organizing. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody, for participating. Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Thanks.